morning. Thank you folks for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii. Want to remind everybody that this is the fundraising time of the year. So please help us stay in contact, help us stay connected with you. And if you're moved to contribute, please do, thinktechhawaii.com. This morning we have with us a really stellar group of people. We have about to become Dean of University of Detroit Mercy School of Law, Jelani Jefferson Exum. We understand that will take place on July 1st. Thank you. So there's going to be at least two celebrations within days of each other of a new level of independence that this all signifies. And we're just really loving seeing it. The Camille Nelsons, the Song Richardsons, the there's just there's a litany of wonderful, wonderful additions to leadership in legal education. And it's great to see Dan Exum become another one of those. Thank you so much. Thanks for raising the bar for all of us. We have Professor Ernelia Randall, University of Dayton School of Law, Emerita. My, my Latin background, there is a gender distinction there. Definitely, and I always point it out. Thank you. And I appreciate that reminder. And Ms. Waitman, my you do a good job. high school Latin teacher, would be happy to see that observed. <clears throat> On the other end of the gender, hey, Emeritus Professor Ben Davis, who will be delivering a commencement address this Saturday that... Uh, we hope to get access to and be able to share. <clears throat> and Tina Patterson from Germantown, Maryland, mediator, arbitrator, and critical thinker par excellence as each of these four panelists are. So we're going to, without further delay, treat you to some of that. Tina, you were talking a little bit about the article you read this morning in the New York Times talking about the level to which division and deceit have come together in a particular group that we refer to as the Republican Party leadership here. What's your take on that? Where's that coming from? Sure. Um, and what I was referring to is a New York Times op-ed piece by David Leonhardt and the the article title is um, Liz Cheney's ouster is the sign of the Republican Party's growing discomfort with democracy. The outline of the article is essentially regarding two pieces. One is the ouster of Ms. Cheney, but underlying that is the, the new state voting laws and how at least 10 states have suddenly changed their laws that for many of us, we think there's no real impact, but there is an impact. And underlying that is the, the impact in the, for the elections in the years 2022, as well as 2024. And while the media may be focusing primarily on Ms. Cheney, the rule of law, which is what you focus on in this program, is at stake. It's, it's literally in the precipice. And while we talk about it, action has to be taken. And I think part of it is stemming back to, and this article also mentions it, is the events that took place in November um, and how we continue to see this dialogue regarding a lie regarding the outcome of the election and the media initially um, supporting it, being very soft in approach and later saying, we can't find anything factual to back up the statement, and, but it perpetuates itself. And it's why we see the outcome of, and the media is still dancing with this term, I'll just call it what I see it as, insurrection. If we were in any other country or talking about another country, it would be called a coup d'etat, a golpe de estado, or an insurrection. And part of it, again, is tying back to the events of November. And prior to that, I should say the past four years. So I'll, I'll pause there because I know that was a mouthful. It's a great place to start. And, and Professor Randall, you reminded us in a previous session about a distinction that may be really important in connection with what Tina just said. And that is that while the rule of law 
may not be essential to the growth and perpetuation of capitalism. It, it may very well be essential to the growth and sustainability of democracy. Where does that distinction come from? What causes? Well, so first of all, I uh, I don't think we have a democracy and have never had a democracy. And to talk about reinstating democracy starting four years ago is to ignore that we've never had a democracy. And to lay it at the feet of the Republicans when the Democrats have done just as much to undermine the rule of law of democracy. I mean, the Democrats and the Republicans work together to make sure that they maintain control of the political system. They keep out socialists, they keep out communists, they keep out everybody but themselves. Now, yes, there's some, it, it has in the last four years, the Republican Party has taken it to a different level on an in, on a voting right. But when you look at it, it's consistent with what they've done my lifetime. So it's sort of like, you know, there's an outrage, which we should be, but to think that somehow this is remarkably different than what's been going on uh, by both Republicans and Democrats, and, and I'll stop here. I'm not sure this answers your question. This was the thought in my head. but. Part of the thing that is not being talked about, which is upsetting to me, is how the Republicans and the Democrats had a bipartisan agreement where they included restriction, uh, increased the, abil uh, the amount of money third parties would have to pay to get their candidates on the ballot. And that just kind of like slipped on by everyone. Um, while and 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 that's as much a threat to getting democracy. And that's what I would rather phrase it to: we need to move to getting a democracy, as opposed to protecting it. We don't have it. We've never had it, but it's possible we could get it. Um, and that's kind of my reflection, and I know that's not even responsive, but. No, actually, it's, it's right on the point because it reminds us that while the pandemic and media may have accentuated <clears throat> things that have been systemic patterns, anti-Black racism, anti-Asian American Pacific Islander racism, <clears throat> exclusion of people with disabilities, <clears throat> of LGBTQ plus people and other excluded groups. This has been going on for a very, very, very long time. So what moves us in a better direction? Ben, Dean Exum, thoughts? Um, I, I would okay. say that I have a thought, I don't know if it helps, uh, but uh, it comes back to uh, a speech of Martin Luther King in 1967, which was basically talking about the, there are people in the United States who like to have democracy for them and dictatorship for others, right? And so the whole thing that, and then kind of tying in with what Bernelli is saying, is that democracy for the two parties and dictatorship for the third parties in that vision, of that kind of that package. And I, I'm not sure what else can be done about that, but at least in our constitutional structure, you know, what I would hope is that with these 400 bills that have been put in various parts of governments around the country at state level, that there would be the countervailing federal bill to at least address the kinds of clear efforts that essentially try and create. They're trying to shape the electorate so they took that electorate as democracy and then everyone else has got a dictatorship. Uh, unfortunately, the, you know, there's the, the whole Senate problem, but um, I, 
match. That you know, that's that's the countervailing force I can see that that, that can happen, other than people being in the streets, of course. Yeah. And I, I also, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know what the solutions are, but I'll just offer another observation, which is that, I mean, when it comes to how, to our political structure with both parties, the, the goal is to win. And that's always been the goal because you don't have any power if you're not, you know, the party in power. It's just very difficult to push your agendas ahead and things like that. And so what I think has happened specifically with the Republican Party in this moment is they found a winning strategy which is, you know, to sort of perpetuate this sort of rhetoric, um, this message. They have folks who've really captured it and and have, um, you know, or I say they found a winning strategy. Let's say that they believe they found a winning strategy, right? I'll put it that right. way. Um, and so they're going hard on that, thinking, you know, this is what's going to get us um, where we need to be because otherwise we don't have power to push our agenda forward. And then as Professor Randall pointed out, none of this is new, right? It's all kind of repackaged. So on voting rights, we should have, you know, it's, it's expected. There's always a backlash to, you know, to any sort of um, progress. So of course, we'd see, you know, Trump loses, there's going to be backlash. Um, if there is, you know, if there are enough Republicans who can um, push something forward, they're going to push forward what they've always tried to do. Um, and so, you know, they're just in a position where they're able to do what their party has always wanted to, to get done. And so then I'll just add one other piece there um, that um, Ben made me think of, which is, you know, what can we do about it? I don't know. But I just keep thinking about the importance of judges who are thinking about the Constitution and constitutional structure and, you know, how um, we would hope you know, just kind of thinking about history. And at different points, we've really been at the mercy of like judicial interpretation of our protections. And, you know, we're circling back to that diversity aspect, which is, you know, we're, we're stuck with for a long time with the judges that were put in place in the past administration. And that to me is, is um, disheartening. I'll put it that way. You're only stuck with them to the extent that the Democrats are unwilling to do more to change the system. The Democrats want to support the system as exists. While they want to get a little bit of change, but they don't want to undermine the existing system so much because it works in their favor when they're in power. And, and 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 they're not going to want to because they could. I mean, I well, the Democrats. Have, the problem the Democrats have is uh, they have they're more of a right to the right party with a lot of people to the right. So it's going to be hard for them to do anything. But there are solutions to the judge problems. My my own suggestion is pack the appellate courts. Forget the Supreme Court. Pack the appellate courts because there's only so much that the Supreme Court's going to be able to do. And the appellate courts will control people's lives. And the Supreme Court, yeah, will have ultimate decision. But even when the Supreme Court acts, we can always have a president who ignore them. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's been established at least twice in our history. So. The Democrats can say, hey, look, you know what? We're not going to the this right wing Supreme Court. We're going to pack the appellate courts so that appellate courts are as favorable as possible to our agenda. And if we have the power, we are going to ignore Supreme Court decisions. But the Supreme Court is happy. I mean, the Democrats are happy with the system as is. They just want to. They don't want to undermine that system by taking the suggestions or doing something that would, you know, fundamentally change the system. And it, I don't see how. That's a brilliant insight, Professor, is that theoretically the Democrats could add a lot of appellate federal positions through a budgetary authorization that they could do with 50 votes or 50 plus one. <clears throat> so going back a little bit, one of the viewers asked, <clears throat> they've heard 100 Republicans are threatening to split off from the party. We need to look a little bit deeper on that one because if you look at which 100 
Republican as those are, they're complaining that the Republican leadership is too moderate. They're even farther right than the ones who are, are saying directly contradictory things within minutes of each other. Mitch McConnell right. saying Trump is guilty of sin, but voting to acquit him. <clears throat> McCarthy saying nobody is claiming that this election was fraudulent. <clears throat> I met with the president and he was legitimately elected and that's our leadership. And then he turns right around and says, but we're gonna use that lie to justify over 400 voter suppression bills as compared to 40 in all of 2020 that were presented to legislation. So yeah. we know what's going on. Are people gonna right. stand for this? Yeah. Look, one thing I was thinking about was uh, uh, this uh, representative Stefanik, who was being proposed to be the third uh, to replace uh, Cheney, right? And one of the points uh, that was made by people who know her know very well was how she had flipped. You know, they were like sad by watching how she flipped. And one of the points that was made is that her fundraising increased by seven times from around whatever she had at the last time she ran to like three and a half million dollars. So like literally she could say, I can see which side my butter is, uh, what well, my bread is butter, right? And, and if you think of that money part of it, that why would I keep this big lie going? Cause it gets me money as a, you know, and, and it's got nothing to do with reality. It's got to do with getting to power and to get the power, you know, money is the lifeblood as uh, Representative Clyburn said, of uh, of politics, and so you you know you say what you can to get more money. That's uh, and that seems to work very well with this big lie. Um, mm -hmm. On the Democratic side, it's the countering the big lie. You know that gets, that, but it's still everybody's getting paid. You know, and that in, in that kind of vision of things, uh, which uh, I don't know what the answer is, but uh, it's a hell of a deal. Because people's votes are going to be suppressed, or they're trying to suppress. It. If you're trying to fight that, 400 different bills in 400 different states match the resources you have to have to bring those cases, all those different places. I mean, that it, it, it sucks up your resources as an entity trying to address that. I don't know which entities can do it, but you know the NAACP. I know did a filed something in Georgia, but then you're going to have Florida, you're going to have Arizona, you're going to, you know, just the lawyer part of it. So maybe it's the Civil Rights Division, which I understand is looked very carefully at this recount in uh, in Arizona, or it's not even a recount, okay, this fraud audit, okay, that's going on. I've been asking people, why isn't this election interference? This privately funded uh secret count of the actual ballot that people in Maricopa County uh, actually did. Why is that not election interference under our law? To me, it seems like it is, but I, you know, I'm just I mean, a crazy guy. But that's the thing. It's not election interference unless a court says it is. Right. To me, that's the whole <laughs> that's the whole thing is like none of not, you know, law is what it's interpreted to be. So at, at some point it comes down to, you know, who is telling us what the law is. And we and, and that's why I go back to, to judges. I mean, in some ways, they're far removed from the everyday and everything that's happening. But in some ways, they really, you know, they're, they're just points in time when we really count on that decision to, you know, kind of stop something or move something along. And I think it just really matters who's in those, who's in those seats. It's not election yeah. interference unless prosecutors say they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 it could, if in fact, the prosecutors in the Department of Justice decided to bring a case, they might not win the case at trial, but it could slow up the count very significantly. They could get a temporary restraining order right. to stop like, it until it works its way through the court 
And the question I have is, why haven't the Democrats done that? Why yeah, haven't because- they undertaken the prosecutorial attempts to stop the Republican uh, interference? Because I, I, saw, I understand there's a federal law about conserving, preserving for 22 months ballots in a federal election. And that, you know, there's either civil or criminal penalties for failing to do that. It just seems to me that, geez, that seems like a pretty obvious case that they're, they're, they're using them kind of like McDonald's wraps almost, you know, the way that they're taking care of them. I mean, there are people inside who have been observers who criticized how lackadaisical the folks have been with these things, you know? I mean, these I, I, I've sat as a poll watcher and watched people vote, and it's one of the most moving experiences to see people exercise the franchise. And each one of those ballots, in a certain sense to me, is kind of like a person's will as to how they want their country to be. They're not just pieces of paper we flip around with. There's something special. And 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 you know, I, this this kind of cavalierness with them, to me, and I may be crazy, I, I agree. Civil Rights Division should be all over this at the federal level. But also the state, under the state rules, should be all over this too. And I understand the political thing of like, who's going to vote for me the next time around? But that's not the point, it seems to me. If you don't step up, what did uh, Cheney say? If you don't set up to contest the liar, you give the liar power. And that's the problem. And Cheney should know because her father was a big liar. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. She knows the game. And she supported him in that lie. Oh, so, oh, I look. mean, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, having me quote Liz Cheney when I was used to really despise her for how she was rationalized torture, okay, is that's telling me how crazy this, this thing has gotten. Because she was actually saying things that made sense in a world where, you know, you're looking for the adults in the room. Where are the adults in the room? I'm going to say it like that. All that said to me when she supported it is is it the sociopaths on both sides who will switch sides to say whatever isn't necessary at the point. She's hooked her pet. She's. She hooked her thing for a lot of reasons, including defense of her father, to being a non-Trump person. And she's willing to say whatever's necessary in that arena. And, and, and she's not a rational per- She's not a person to be trusted and to be believed that she's doing something out of the goodness of protecting democracy. She she okay. desires to gain regain power yes. for herself Great. and her friends, and okay. and 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 that's the road she has to take. If she could take a different road, she would. She'd do it. Rest assured, Bernil, uh, Professor Randall. I never believe a politician promises. Right? They only bind the person who believes them. Okay? I'm just looking at the words that were said and saying those words were good words to hear. I don't know what's going on in her head. I don't know what she's planning and what's her strategy. But I'm just saying that I, I said that, that that was a good speech, you know. But, but I mean, but don't you think then that we have to look beyond what the words people say? Because that's what Trump people did. Yes. They just looked at the words he said and not the person behind it. Okay. So didn't Maya Angelou say that if a person shows you who they are, believe them, right? Yes, yes. Right? <laughs> yes. And so they, she has shown us who she is, or these other people have shown us who they are. I believe them. And they are, to me, very dangerous people. They will go to violence. They've already gone to violence. They will go to violence. And the system will not do anything about them. You see these people... Uh, testifying yesterday who were running the Department of Defense and they were whitewashing everything that we all saw on TV. I said, there's nothing here. There's nothing in these people. It, 
unbelievable. It's like, it's like, I don't know how people, you know, the only thing I can think of is people get paid. They get paid. It's, it's worth them money to get, it's worth them for them to say these things because they will get paid. As in America, you know, like in that movie, Killing Me Softly, Brad Pitt said America's about getting paid. And that's all that's going on. I don't know, but it's just really surreal. Yeah, actually, I'd say it's surreal. If you know, if I wrote this as a novel, you would say, "No, Ben, we can't publish it. This is not serious." You know, but I don't know. I don't so, know. as we move into our last couple of minutes, what are the takeaways? Uh, Tina, you reminded us that Linhart's article faulted the Democrats just as much as the Republicans. And Professor Randall has been very clear in saying that's been a pattern for a very, very long time. Besides the DOJ, where might we go from here? Who do we look to for hope? I agree with Professor Randall. I think it's the lower court. Um, I, I, I honestly do. Packing. And I was going to ask, has that is, is it too late or is that event approaching? I, I personally don't think it's too late. I think this is the time to take action. But Professor Exum also touched upon it. And that's, are you willing to step out? If you are an elected official, are you willing to step out risking that you may not make it through the next cycle and you know, know that you're going home and be OK with that? And I, I'm fairly certain I can say most of elected officials don't want that. They, you know, they've got a long-term strategy, whether that's to stay in office as long as possible or until someone comes and picks them up to take them home forever. And it might not take that much money to add 100 federal district judges and 50 federal appellate judges. See you next one. I was going to say, I still, I mean, and I, I agree with all that. I still think that there's... Um, you know, hope in grassroots voter efforts, because at the end of the day, that's what that's what everybody at the top is after um, in some extent, not because they necessarily want to be representatives of those people's voices, but they do want the numbers and they're looking for rhetoric that will resonate enough to get some of these numbers. And I think that, um, you know, we saw this last time around that those efforts on the ground to, you know, sort of raise up a new crop of voters, getting them out there and all that. Now, you know, of course, that, that's why we're seeing the restrictive voting um, laws coming out, because, you know, everybody knows that that is also um, a part of the strategy. So, I mean, I still have have some hope there. I think that's always been, especially, you know, thinking about the Black community, that's, that's always been um, something that that people have been, you know, working on and, and, and kind of finding new ways to do that on these um, kind of local levels too. So, so, you know. I wish as a Black community, we would put as much effort into getting a viable third party as we put into getting voters for Democrats and Republicans. That, you know, I, yeah, it seems to me that we're pouring money down a sump hole that, when, that it ain't never going to happen. The Democrats and Republicans are never going to protect our interests. And whether we turn out voters for the Democrats, whether we turn out Republicans, we are going to be unhappy with the results. And so I wish we would give up on that. I don't know whether, given that the Democrats and Republicans have effectively closed out third parties, that effort would probably fail, but I'd feel better if we were working on that than continuing to support what is obviously a system that's not going to ever give back what we put in. So thank you all. Let's come back to that in a couple of weeks, and let's think about how we might meaningfully enfranchise those groups that do make the difference, the minority voters, the young voters, Socialist, communist. and conscience. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Come join Thank us you. again in a couple of weeks. Thank you. We'll be back.